Hey, how are you guys? Oh man, I can't hear anything. I still got my ears in. <laughs> man, it is so good to be with you guys today. My name is Chris, and, uh, and I'm the electric guitar player, and they'll just let anybody preach here. Actually, I'm, uh, I'm the discipleship pastor, and, um, and uh, I, I get the opportunity to play with this, uh, this awesome worship team uh, from time to time, a lot of the time. Actually, what a welcome you to Bible Christian Church. Um, I think you guys know it by now. We could say it together. We are a church that is what? bringing life to our community, right? And I am so glad you're here. Now, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but I'm wearing this super cool Bible Christian Church t-shirt. Isn't this awesome? All right, so there's only, there's only one way to get it, actually. And so I'll tell you, I had these shirts in my office, and our senior pastor, Brian, he came in and said, Chris, I've got to have one of these shirts. And I said, no. <laughs> You have to be a part of the First Impression team. So guess what? Brian and Sonia are now a part of our First Impressions team, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, uh, we're, we're kicking it off next week. If you guys want to be a part of helping people feel welcome, bringing life, um, being life-giving people as they come through the door, uh, it's a once-a-month commitment. And what's great is you don't even have to, like... Like, I don't know that they'll actually let me be on the team. Uh, so it's being led by Lisa Wagner. And uh, could you just raise your hand, Lisa? Yeah. Yeah. And so, so right now we are in the phase of, of we're getting people plugged in. We're going to have a great team set up uh, for next week as we kick it off. But if you want to be a part of it, if you want one of these awesome shirts, you have to be on the First Impressions team. All right? Hey, I don't know if you noticed, but the, the music that preceded me coming up here and, the, and that graphic work, um, we are in this series called The Upside Down Kingdom. And so uh, we're going to wrap it up today. And if you've been following along, it's this idea that what God calls us to as we are on this spiritual journey, as we're finding our way back to Him, uh, as we're following Jesus, it, it is, that, is that the right things in the kingdom of God are often the wrong things in the kingdom of the world, right? And the right things in the kingdom of the world are often the wrong things in the kingdom of God, right? So it's this upside-down kingdom. And so, so our Savior Jesus says, we have to be born again. You want me to what, Jesus? You want me to hit the reset button on this? You know, I, I think I've got the, this life figured out. But no, he wants us to step anew into his kingdom. He says things like, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than a rich person to enter the kingdom. That's an upside down thing to say. And what he's saying is, is that we have to release control of our finances to the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of whatever our house is, right? The kingdom of heaven, Jesus says, belongs to children. And so, so we have to become like children. We have to become filled with awe and wonder. And, and guess what? Not have all the answers. And, and sometimes we're even going to have to trust God, even if we don't like where he's leading us. And so these are the glimpses that we get into the kingdom of God, which is so upside down from this world, right? The kingdom of the world tells us that we have to fight to, to, to maintain our rights, right? But the kingdom of God actually tells us to give up our rights for the sake of others coming into the kingdom. The kingdom of the world tells us that we have to have it all together. But the kingdom of God is designed for those who don't. You see, it's upside down. And so if you're a Jesus follower, there should be tremendous tension in your life as you try to be a citizen of the United States, a citizen of this world, and a citizen of heaven. And that's difficult stuff. I don't know about you, but it's hard work trying to follow Jesus. Did anybody ever, ever tell you that it's easy to follow Jesus? Because if they did, they lied, okay? Because here's the reality. He says and does a lot of things that don't come natural to us. Isn't that right? Okay, but today, I think this is the hardest teaching of all, the hardest teaching of, of, of pretty much everything Jesus says. In my opinion, what Jesus says in Matthew 5, 44, and I want you to go ahead and get ready. Uh, you can open up your Bibles. You can open up your Bible apps. We're going to be in Matthew 5, starting in verse 43 here in just a moment. But I can promise you that no one listening in this room or listening online is good at this. How do I know? 
Well, let's read and see, okay? Matthew 5, 43 and down. This is Jesus talking. He's, he's preaching this incredible sermon, and he tells this huge group of people, he says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and send rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? And so if Jesus, if Jesus would have left it right there, that'd be hard enough. But then he says, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. What? Are you kidding me? I feel like Doc Brown in Back to the Future when he finds out that we need 1.21 gigawatts to travel back into time. And if you recall that scene, he's basically, he's putting his hand on his head and he's like, this is impossible. It would take a bolt of lightning. I think we all know that line, right? So let's break this down practically because Jesus is saying, love your neighbors and pray for those who persecute you. What does that mean? Here's a quick check. How much do you love the members of ISIS? How much do you love the people in your local chapter of the KKK? That's uncomfortable, isn't it? How much do we love the Nazis who were in charge of concentration camps? How much do we love legislators who insist that abortion be legal up to nine months? How much do we love people who disagree with us? How about the latest person who decided that they were going to go into a school full of children and start firing? How much do we love them? Now, that's an absurd question, isn't it? Like, if we're honest with ourselves, and I hope that we can get really honest with each other, I think that love your enemies is one of the most unreasonable things that Jesus says. Can we, can we just, can we be straight up? That's pretty unreasonable. And and that's saying something, right? Because this is the guy who said, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. We talked about that last week, right? He says, hate your mother and father and sell all your possessions and give money to the poor, but love your enemies? Come on. And to get more specific, this means simply more than just the inconsiderate jerks who pop up occasionally in our lives, right? Right? We're not just talking about the guy at work who keeps stealing our our lunch out of the fridge. We're not talking about the lady who cut us off on the highway and then may have given us an inappropriate gesture after the fact. Right? You see, we have to consider the context in which Jesus was delivering this sermon. Right? The group of people that Jesus was talking to, and including himself, were under the rule of an oppressive, occupying Roman government. Remember that that Romans employed torture and murder to keep people in line, right? So everyone who's listening to Jesus talk in this moment about loving your enemies had plenty of opportunity to experience this deep hatred towards real enemies in the soldiers and the officials that carried almost almost this daily oppression in the lives of the Hebrew people. And so in the middle of Jesus' sermon on the mount, knowing knowing about his own context, he tells his followers to love their enemies, knowing full well who their enemies were. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm sitting there listening to things, honestly, I think if I'd have heard, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood, I'd be like, yeah, whatever, Jesus. But if he said, love your enemies, I'd be like, no, I'm done. I'm out. Right? And and he's not talking about when he says to pray for those who persecute you. He's not saying, dear Lord, please smite those filthy Romans who are oppressing your people and, 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 and they don't love you and they don't care about your law. Jesus is telling them, as he's telling us right now, to pray for those who make your life hell on earth. He's telling them to pray for the tax collectors, 
who make it so that they can barely have enough to eat. Pray for the people who've done horrific things to the people you love. That is what he's saying. Now, I I think it would be easy to overlook this section of Scripture to go, okay, love your enemies, you know, granted, whatever, you know, I'll just, I'll be kind to mean people, all right? But, right, because I I think that's kind of how we take that, right? But, But when when we look at the, at the context of Scripture, when we look at, like, this theme that threads throughout the Old and the New Testament, it's this upside-down way of thinking from the rest of the world. Let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 34. Now, in this passage, we find a community of Jesus followers who've experienced unfair treatment at the hands of an oppressive government or a group of people who are in power. So let's take a look at this, and our Bibles are up on the screen. The writer of Hebrews says, You joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. They didn't retaliate. They didn't protest this unfair treatment of themselves. And so, so I think about, as we're, as we're coming up on Palm Sunday, okay, and it's, I don't know how many of you guys went to old school churches where, where they, would, they, would, they would give you a palm leaf as you would come in. Have you guys ever been to a place where they give you a palm leaf? You know, and we would, we would sing, um, you know, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, right? But when I think about loving your enemies, this, this idea of Palm Sunday fits so nicely into that, but it's different than what we think. Uh, I, I, was, I was reading this, and it jumped off the page, so we're going to take a look at this together. It's Luke 19, verses 37 to 42. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. And, and I think a lot of times we're like, all right, cool story. Hey, you know, I love that he came in on a donkey and people are praising him and, and they're, they're celebrating him as their king. But that's not the end of what is actually happening in this story, is it? Take a look. It says, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. Do you think Jesus was weeping over the city because of what was about to happen in a week or so? Do you think Jesus was weeping over the city because he knew that his fate was, was, was going to be a, a cross where he would be tortured and murdered? Do you think that's why he was weeping? Because actually it's not. Look at what he said. If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. Church, he's weeping over the fate of people who were going to torture him and hang him on a cross. Who's he weeping over? He's weeping over his enemies. You see, Jesus didn't just say it. He felt it. He wept over it. He lived it. And keep in mind, when he was on the cross, as he was being shamed and made a spectacle of, and he was having nails driven into him, he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. You see, the way Jesus handled his death ministered to the criminal on the cross. One of the criminals is like absolutely belligerent, but the other one is like, this guy's got something I don't. Truly, this is the Son of God. And and he acknowledges who Jesus is, and Jesus says, you're going to be in paradise with me real soon. Right? See, church, how we handle the unfair circumstances in our lives will speak loudly to a world who needs to know Jesus. You see, what does that look like today? Well, so when I read the news or, or when I see the horrible things that, 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 that come across my, my uh, social media feed or I, I hear about the latest shooting or the latest service member that's been killed, my natural response is to dehumanize the people or the, uh, or the person who does those things. So in my head, I'm subconsciously saying those people are nothing like me right? They're monsters. They're demons. Or whatever it takes to pretend that they're not fellow humans. But that's not true, is it? 
Think about this. Each person who shoots up a school was born. Each person who commits an act of terrorism, who blows themselves up in a crowd full of people, had a mother. Each one of them has had personal experiences that lead them to the place where they feel like the actions that they took in that horrific moment were the only steps they possibly could have taken. They felt joy and pain just like you and me. They are human. How many people are really uncomfortable with that right now? I'm just going to be real honest. I'm real uncomfortable with that. You see, we believe that that life doesn't happen with God ordaining it, right? Uh, So the Bible tells us that that life doesn't happen without God, right? We we read that not only did he create everything, but Hebrews 1.3 says that God upholds the universe by his power, okay? And so he didn't just set things in motion and walk away. He's intimately involved in how the world works. And so if we believe what Scripture says to be true, then the terrorists and the racists, and the murderers are actually fellow humans created by God, and check this out, are loved by him. For God so loved good people that he sent his only son. That's not how that goes, is it? For God so loved the Christians, the world. Exactly. He's like, get it right. (laughs) But God so loved the world, right? And so obviously, I'm not supporting actions of those who've who've committed these incredible atrocities. I'm not saying that legal action shouldn't be taken. But here's where being a citizen of the world and being a citizen of heaven becomes very difficult if we're honest with ourselves. You see, if we hate the people who do those things, I'm not hating a monster or a demon. I'm actually hating fellow humans. And some of them are suffering from mental illness or religious manipulation. We don't know their story. It doesn't justify it, okay? But this is the hardest thing to hear, but it's true. We can't hate people and love God. We can't hate people and love God. It can't be done. And so no matter how awful that person is, we can't hate people and love God. No matter what they've done to someone you love, we can't hate people and love God. And this wrecks me because I rarely get it right, okay? I'm up here preaching not because I've got this stuff together, but because I happen to get the job as pastor, okay? And see, here's what Jesus is calling us to. In the midst of grief and anger for those who suffer, we are called to grieve the circumstances of those who had no hope. We're called to grieve the circumstances of those who never experienced compassion. We're called to grieve the circumstances of those who have no understanding of grace and mercy and mourn also for those who cause pain. It doesn't mean that we don't desire justice, but it does mean that hatred does not drive us. Okay, and this isn't easy, But Jesus commands us to do it, and we see many, many examples of him loving people who hated him. And listen, I'm not trying to humanize terrorists, racists, oppressors, and murderers because they deserve it or because I'm ignoring their action. I want to humanize them because they're humans. And it's also the only way that we can hope to stop the wave of terrorism and shooting at schools and malls and houses of worship because there's no legislation, there's there's nothing that humans are going to be able to do to stop that. But Jesus actually empowers us, doesn't he? He empowers us as his followers to cut that stuff off at the core. You see, if these actions, if these horrible things that are happening are the work of monsters and demons, here's the reality. I'm powerless to stop them. I can only shake my head and feel sad that such things happened. And they can't be stopped. But if I'm dealing with humans, I have hope. Instead of stealing hope by putting myself in the place of judge... Guess what we get to do as Jesus followers? We get to remove ourselves from the seat of judgment, put God in it, and deal hope by handing it over to God. See, I hope that my actions of love and compassion and peace, that those could be heard and felt and understood and recognized as the actions of God by those who don't know him. You see, I have hope because maybe, just maybe, check this out, church, that God can redeem even the worst of sinners. Do you believe that? You know how I know that? 
because he redeemed me. You don't know me, but I know me. See, I think loving our enemies, it forces us to come face to face with the reality that we're broken and messed up people. And we're not even on a curve, okay? I mean, all of us, were it not for Jesus, would be capable of some pretty horrible stuff. You know, the Bible even tells us that. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all, uh, all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Church, we're messed up. God knows this. But we spend most of our try- time trying to convince other people that we're not, and God. But Jesus gives us this command to love our enemies and to pray for those who persecute us to wake us up. You see, we want to pretend that our problems are somehow caused by Satan. Okay, now indirectly, they are, right? Because we have sin. We have this separation from God. But it's like, it's like we attribute uh, the, 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 the traits of God to Satan. We're like, oh, Satan's around the corner looking to trip me up. He's not omnipresent. God is, right? Now, Scripture tells us he's roaring about seeking whom he may devour. But if we're honest with ourselves, we're just laying out a spread for him with our own bad decisions and selfish desires, aren't we? We're creating a golden corral for Satan to walk up to and chow down. But Jesus says, no, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. James says it like this in James 4, 7. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. See, I, I, think, I think this does two distinct things in our lives. First, by, by loving our enemies and praying for those who persecute us, we show to others who do not know God what he's like. Does that make sense? When we love those who hate us, we live out scripture and act like God. Okay, how do I know that? Let's check out Romans chapter 5, verses 10, verses 8 through 10. It says this, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved? from God's wrath through him, meaning Jesus, right? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Church, we were God's enemies. And God put in the effort. It gave us the opportunity to be in a right relationship with him, didn't he? Verse 8 says that God demonstrates his own love for us in this, in the action of loving those who hated him. God demonstrates his love for us by saving those who were far from him. And it causes us to do the same thing in the action of loving those who are far from God, in the action of loving those who hate us. We demonstrate God's love to those who are enemies of him. And by loving our enemies, we further shut the door on Satan and his lies and his violence and his hate. Amen? And the second thing it does for us, and this is subtle, okay? But it actually, it's, it's the overarching theme of everything that Jesus teaches us. Jesus wants to be our Lord, right? Can we agree on that? That Jesus wants to be our Lord. He wants to be our everything, Right? And so he wants to take the satisfaction that we have in our financial security. And he wants us to take that security and that, financial, and that satisfaction and put it on him. Right? He wants us to take the satisfaction in our own righteousness and our own ability to do good things. And he wants us to take that, that confidence because Paul says that it's like filthy trash and uses words that aren't appropriate for church, but it's in the Bible. And he says, and he says put that confidence and that trust in Jesus. And you know what else we find deeply satisfying? You know, I don't know about you, but I find justice so satisfying. Right? Right? And, and so, um, I, I don't know about you, but I love those, those videos that show where, like, people get instant justice for bad actions. Okay? Yeah, that's, yeah, like, we, we can acknowledge that that's a, when we've had a rough day, there's nothing worse than seeing people reap the rewards of their actions instantaneously. 
right? Now see, I, one of my favorites is, is the one where this guy takes a, a lightweight aluminum baseball bat and, and he goes and he's going to smash a car with it. Now I don't know about you guys, but I love cars and if you know me, you know this, right? And I love cars that not a lot of people like. And, and in fact, I love some of the worst cars and I don't know why, but I just do. But this guy takes his baseball bat and he's getting ready to smash a super sweet 1986 or 87 Cadillac Sedan DeVille. Some of you guys are like, gross. And he winds up with all of his might, and he swings that bat right into the windshield, and it catches the A-pillar and bounces right back up and hits him in the face and knocks him out cold. And it is so satisfying. I'm like, cool old car, one, belligerent guy, zero. Right? But, but church, check this out. Jesus wants to be our satisfaction for justice. Because you know what he didn't give us? Justice. We love justice for other people, but, but we don't want justice for ourselves. You see, he wants, he wants us to experience and rejoice in mercy and grace because that's what he's given us, right? He wants to be our all-satisfying treasure. And so he commands us to love our enemies. He wants us to trust him to be the judge who makes all things right according to him, not to us. But you know what? We like, what we do is we go, no thanks, Jesus, I'll be the judge here. I'll hate. And and actually, sometimes it gets so bad where we go, you know what, Jesus, I don't trust that you're going to judge this right. You see, the kingdom, the kingdom is actually not about us. It's not about us. We're saved for a purpose, right? We're not just saved to be saved, right? We're saved to invite other people into the kingdom. It's about who's coming up behind us, isn't it? It's about the next generation who doesn't know God. Church, did you know that the church is about those who are outside of the walls, not inside the walls, right? You see, the kingdom is about the one who is furthest from God. There's the story of the lost sheep, the lost coin, the buried treasure. Those are all things, those are all stories about those who are furthest from God. It's about joyfully, check this out, giving up our rights and our preferences because we trust God so much and we know that he's got something better for us than what we could make happen ourselves. See, this is living in the upside-down kingdom, isn't it? See, the gravity of the kingdom of this world is pulling us down, but we have to keep pushing up. In this world, we will find trouble, Jesus tells us. There's this incredible tension of the things that the world is trying to tell us is true, but the opposite, they're the opposite of what God is telling us is true, right? See, Jesus doesn't leave us there. He says, but I give you my peace. Church, Jesus wept for those who would torture and eventually murder him. Perhaps we could mourn for those who would intentionally do us wrong and the people we love. You see, this is what it means to love our enemies. I see time and time again, people want nothing to do with Jesus because of how they're treated by people who say that Jesus is their Savior. What if the enemies of God could say that Christians were the kindest, most generous, compassionate, and loving people they'd ever met? What if if non-Christians could say that about Christians? You're absolutely right. I'm not saying that we stop championing holiness, but perhaps we should allow God to be holy and allow ourselves to be the beneficiaries of that. Does that make sense? You see, this is one of Jesus' hardest teachings, but it's what sets us apart from the world. He says, even the pagans love the people who love them. See, I don't expect us to walk away from today thinking, wow, that was great. I feel really great about myself. (laughs) When I was writing this sermon, I'm like, Jesus, I can't say this. But here we are. Because this is what Scripture tells us. Amen? You see, I want us to walk away both challenged to love our enemies, but also encouraged that we have the power to do it, because we do. The very same power that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in his followers. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to pray here in a minute, minute, and then the worship team is going to lead us to the throne together. Okay, if you need prayer, just want to walk through what all this means, have a conversation around it, I'll be in the connection point. There's probably 
People smarter in the church than I am about this kind of thing are better at it than I am. But I'll be in the connection point at the end of the service. Let's stand with me. We're going to pray, and then we're going to worship together, okay? So Jesus, we just want to celebrate what it is that you've told us, even if, even if it's hard to celebrate it because we're terrible at it. God, we want to rejoice in the things that you've told us, and we can rejoice in those things. Rejoice in those things because we know we have a God who's gone before us and he's done it. We have a God who, who came from heaven to teach us how to be human. So God, we declare today that you're a better judge than we are. We declare today that you can have that chair of judgment that we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna trust you. God, to be a righteous judge. We're going to trust you to take care of the things that you said you're going to take care of because we trust you, because you've been so good in our lives. And God, you chip away at us every day. You invite us to be more like you. Lord, I pray today that, that we, would, we, we, would, we would make today a banner day where we declare going to love those who hate us, that we're going to be the opposite of the world, because that's what you called us to. And God, we, we pray these things in your name, because you have the power. You've called us to live it out.